So today we're talking about forecasting and post-flight analysis. Um, I think the main thing we want to get across here is that we don't claim to be experts in weather forecasting. The opposite to experts, really. Probably the opposite. Which is why it's quite useful. Um, we've just been super lucky to get some um, coaching and we've got the, the best forecasting tools, which we're going to show you a bit about today. Um, and most most important thing about this is we're just going to show you how we do this stuff. Uh, we're not necessarily saying it's the right way, uh, but we'll show you how we do it and we'll be quite keen for your feedback. Yeah, but please don't think we're claiming to be experts on any of this. We've just uh, managed to find the best things to um, to get by because we're not actually very good at it. So, um, yeah, hopefully it's useful. Okay, so we'll get started. So a little bit about us. Um, I don't think we're going to dwell on this. We've at done all. this to death now, I think, for most people. Yeah, but, um, um, but if anyone's interested or doesn't know much about us, you can check this out after. We'll have a link with the slides at the end, um, which we'll send out. So in this webinar, um, we're going to start off by covering forecasting. We'll be looking specifically at when do we do the forecasting? When when do we start thinking about it? I know Phil Warner um, did a weather forecasting uh, webinar on Thursday. Yeah, that check that out. It's really good. Really good. Uh, he is an expert, despite what he says. Very technical. Um, uh, so we're not we're going to try not to um, cover the areas that he was covering. We're going to look at the difference between a weather model and forecasts. We're going to look a bit about how we do the forecasting. And then we're going to look at the observation tools. So after we've done the forecast, um, how we monitor the weather before we get flying. Then um, in the middle, we're going to look at some PFA. And again, a little bit about why we do it, um, some of the available softwares and what we use, and then how we do the PFA. And we're going to run through a couple of flights um, with a load of traces and see what things we're looking at and, um, and how we run them together and stuff like that. So. Should be interesting. A little bit about the upcoming webinars after. And then for the last third, we have uh, question and answers again. Um, so, yeah, save them all up to the end. Feel free to get involved. OK. So weather forecasting, Finn. Yeah. Um, so as Phil touched on, um, just some of the key points, really, with forecasting. Um, rarely any benefit in looking more than five days ahead um it's very tempting to all the time especially when you go to gliding comp we do but, it all um, the time yeah all the time uh yeah it's pretty pointless um three to five days ahead we start to look um in a little bit more detail um some basic parameters um yeah but really try not to look in too much detail um you can only really begin to trust the weather forecast about the night before maybe a little bit earlier but um again there's not too much point looking in that much detail and then even overnight, it can change a lot. So I think we both try and focus all our energy on looking at the weather in the morning of a flight. Um, so we have no preconceptions or anything um, looking at it. And uh, yeah, just try and make the time to go over it in all, as much detail as possible in the, in the morning after the last um, last update. It's so tempting to start like setting tasks like three, five days ahead. We're we both, both do it like, all the time. so guilty of it. Um, but there really is very little point until really the morning. So weather forecasting, um, I think it's really important to know the difference between a model uh, and a forecast tool. So a weather model, it takes in observation data. So all of those weather balloons that are going up, taking in data, um, it uses that data to simulate the future state of the atmosphere. Um, so that's what a weather model is. A forecasting tool is different. Um, so the, the forecasting tool interprets a weather model or multiple weather models. It processes the data and then displays the data in an easy to use format. Um, and all of the various forecasting tools available, they do it in different ways. Um, they do the processing in different ways. They display the data in different ways. Uh, it's very much personal preference, which you which um, you choose to use. Um, and just to show you on, on this screen, um, the Met Office in the top left, so that's a really good example of a, a weather model. They've got their own weather model. Um, NOAA is the GFS weather model, the American one. Um, so there's two different weather models there. And then various forecasting tools. So we've got RAS, which is uh, very well known in the UK and actually globally um, for providing soaring forecasts. TAFS, which is like a, a slightly more basic aviation forecast. 
uh, windy.com, which is very good for mapping the wind, another forecasting tool. Nice colors. Top Meteo and our personal favorite, uh, SkySight, which are both storing forecast tools. Um, and I think it's really important to maximize your confidence in the your interpretation of the weather. I think it's really important to use more than one model and more than one tool wherever possible. I think um, we both use as much as we can. Yeah, and mm. we're, we're going to demonstrate that shortly, um, how, how we do that. Um, it's quite difficult in places. So when we've gone and flown in competitions in Europe, sometimes it's quite difficult to look at two different weather models. Um, and I've done a bit of flying in South Africa and Finn's been in Australia. It's very difficult in some places um, to get access to two different weather models, but we always try and do the best we can. So weather forecasting, how do we do it? Um, don't pay too much attention to the slide because we're gonna, we're gonna show you now. So we're gonna turn on screen sharing. We've done your notes for you here. So if you wanna look at everything after, it's got everything listed here for you to um, put onto your computer files or anything like that. So um, they're there for you. Okay, not banking. So you should hopefully be able to see our screen here. Is it working? Someone say yes, that's all right. Not working yet. Okay, bear with. Mm. Uh, it should be now. We can still see the slides. Okay, now you can see our screen. There we go. Yeah, good. All right, here you go. Okay, Finn. nice. Thank you. Um, so, probably start by saying, basically the first thing I do every morning when I wake up, um, this is all on the computer. Um, I have everything on my phone saved as bookmarks as well. So the first thing I do each morning is look for a few basic weather forecasting. Um, or weather forecasts and a couple of sites as well. But um, I'll go through something I do in the competition today, and then at the end, we'll go through the stuff we look at each morning. Um, but when I'm looking in detail to start with, the first thing I'm looking at once or twice a day is the surface pressure chart. Um, not spending too much time on it, just um, getting a basic overview of the weather, really. Um, so this is midnight last night. Um, you can see there's a high pressure over us in the UK. and um, I'm literally just running through it like this. This is for 12 o'clock today. So you can see there's a cold front moving into the south of England with a trough-like uh, thing in front of it, um, potentially like causing some instability. Um, and then we can see from midnight tonight that trough has decayed and the cold front hasn't, um, hasn't reached us. And that's basically all I would need to take from a surface pressure chart looking at a day. Um, it just sort of increases the depth of knowledge I have of the weather going on for the day. And it's very useful to understand um, the weather forecast from your um, your soaring forecast, so you have a better understanding of what's actually happening, happening, and why the models are saying what they're saying. Um, yeah, just a really quick couple of minutes each morning and evening as well, probably. Um, and the next one I do is just look at the basic um, local noddy forecast. Really, um, yeah, usually the Met Office or even iWeather on your phone, just to get a basic overview of um, of the day. And the main things I'm looking at here. Um, cloud cover is um, it's pretty important just to see how it compares with a model. You don't need to know too much detail just to compare it. Um, temperatures, and again, I'll compare that on um, the soaring forecast just to see what the soaring forecast uh, forecasting um, and how that compares with what these say. So if there's a big offset, it's potential um, just to be aware of that. Um, and you'll be able to see quite early in the morning which one's likely to be right um, before you take off. It's quite useful. Um, a little bit about the wind as well and humidity not so important but um yeah mainly the wind is um, it's a surface wind on these but again it's quite useful just to compare it's um not something we go into too much detail in i think the biggest benefit there is is looking at the met office is a completely different weather model yes. compared to what the soaring forecasts um use so that's the main reason why we do a little bit of looking at the met office first um it's before. just yeah just um super easy data to build up a really actually quite detailed image of the day in your head before you even look at the soaring forecast. So yeah, it's pretty, pretty good and pretty easy. Just before you... oh, go on. So on, um, one of the things um, that we'll just mention very briefly is I think it's well worth making a little bookmark marks folder on your computer with all of the things that you like to look at. So this is literally how I do my forecast in the morning. I've got it in the exact order that I look at them and that we're running through now. Um, the links for all of these websites will be um, in this presentation, which we'll upload to the uh, Google Drive the same as last time. 
So now looking at SkySight, we both really like SkySight. We like the user interface. Um, we just like, love its features. And we're just going to show you exactly how we use it. So starting on the left here, I look at the potential flight distance. That's the first thing I tend to look at. And I'll look at that a few days out um, just to, as a general overview, start thinking about whether I should be considering flying on a particular day. Um, and even on the morning, I'll still look at the PFD and mainly look to see how it's changed over the night before. So this is the PFD for today, 26th of April. Actually looks quite reasonable compared to um, some of the flights we've, or some of the days we've had recently. Yeah. Um, and we've got a nice color map here with the yellows representing 600, uh, 600 kilometers. Uh, I think I've configured mine as a, a club class glider and then going down to 300 kilometers. So the PFDs, you've, you've got to um, bear in mind that they, as Phil Warner mentioned the other day, they integrate um, the weather for that particular map for the whole for the, for the whole day. So it can be really good for a short period of time, and that can sometimes uh, bias these to be a bit higher and a bit over optimistic on the PFDs. It's for an in individual point as well. So um, yeah, it's obviously combined, but it's not too literal, I think. So this is the PFD for today. It looks pretty good, um, and flying from Lasham, which is based down here in the middle of the south of the UK, we'd probably be considering tasking up to the northwest, but based, just looking at uh, the basic PFD. The next thing I tend to look at is the thermal strength and boundary shear ratio. And at the top here, we've got a little timeline which we use, um, and I'd look at it for various points throughout the day. And this is the um, same feature as you'd find on RASP. So it's a thermal updraft velocity type map and just gives you an indication of how strong the thermals are likely to be. Question for you? Question, Josh. Is there a way to set the PFD oh, through a club class glider? Oh, on yes, it's all in the settings um, to set your glider type for the PFD. Um, yes. So thermal strength here, and you can cycle through by clicking. And again, hovering the mouse in a particular area gives you a little number. It's quite difficult it's for you to see that. Yeah, but, um, you can see it on there. On our screen, it gives gives you a number of that region that you're pointing the mouse at. The other point on this one is the boundary shear ratio. And the easiest way to explain that is it gives you an idea of how difficult the thermals are going to be to use in practice. Um, and that is shown by the speckledness. So we haven't got much examples. I'll just zoom in a bit here. You can see that in this area, it's a little bit speckled. Um, or mottled, and, and that gives an indication that the thermals there will be a little bit more uh, broken, potentially by the wind, uh, and basically means the thermals will be a bit more difficult to use. A uh, question from Simon. What time of day is SkySight updated? There's a morning model run, usually around 7. It's not exactly the same time every day, I think, um, before you're likely to look at it in the morning. And then there's an evening model run about 5 p.m.-ish, and that's British time, I think. Um, yeah, there's two updates today. Mm. The way you can tell as well is by looking in the bottom corner on the on Sky site on a PC, and it tells you when the last update was run. It's quite um, early today. Yeah, just quite nice. nearly quarter to two. Um, going, so I literally start from the top here and just work down. Height of thermals is next. That's more applicable if it's a blue day. I tend to look at height of thermals. If we're expecting cumulus, then we come to the cloud section, for which I'll hand over to Finn. Mm. Um, the Cumulus, there's some really good features on here. Um, and the first one I tend to look at is just the basic Cumulus cloud base, um, if it's going to be a Cumulus day, that is. Um, and you can see here, it's actually quite good because it was very wispy in the south of England today. And um, you can see a line um, running east to west from uh, Lasham um, and Andover, which is where we are. Um, we're right on the edge of the Cumulus, and that's pretty much what we saw today. So it looks quite good. This, um, this graying area is... Uh, like forecasting wisp basically so maybe cumulus maybe not so um yeah it was pretty pretty good and you can see here um as we go into the the full colors this is where it's expected to be proper cumulus and um a really nice feature here this is the cumulus depth and what this shows us is how um deep the forecast um forecasted cumulus is supposed to be so when we go to somewhere like bath we can see we've got 1400 ish feet of cumulus which is quite deep so it's very unlikely even with a slight temperature difference to the forecast that it's going to go blue. But you can see in the greeny and light yellow areas and um, orange, it's right on the edge. So small differences in temperature or dew points are going to cause cumulus or cause blue conditions, um, which is why 
is quite likely to be wispy, which is what we saw um, from the grayer areas on the um, cumulus cloud-based map. So um, it's a very good feature because you get a better idea. Um, some days it can be completely, um, you can go on the cumulus cloud-based forecast, there can be complete cumulus, but there can be a very shallow depth um, and it can actually have a very small temperature difference. I mean, it's going to be quite blue in a lot of places and you wouldn't necessarily see that. Um, so it's very good to look at the cumulus depth. Um, again, I look at the overdevelopment. You can see here there's almost nothing. Um, these light colors, like 20 or 30%, is very light overdevelopment. Um, so anything above 40 is potential. But today, with um, how dry the air is, and when we look at the skewties later, I'll point this out. You can see it's very unlikely there's going to be over, any overdevelopment. Um, just quickly, sometimes I have a look at the Cape. I wouldn't look today, and it's not so important in the UK. Um, but when we're flying in slightly warmer places like... Um, Hungary was a little bit useful, Australia especially, always have a look at the Cape and you can see the um, it's the potential atmosphere in the uh, energy in the atmosphere basically so and it shows how likely there are to be storms. Um, there's three um, different cloud cover mappings, you've got a low level cloud cover. Um, in every feature on SkySight you can read um, a brief description of what you're seeing, so low level cloud cover here, it's um, percentages of cloud cover of any type um, I think from surface to 4,000 meters. So um, you can see here, very little cloud cover. Um, Mid-level cloud cover, it's from 4,000 meters to 10,000 meters. And then high-level cloud cover here, um, it's from 10,000 meters to 20,000 meters. And it's very, very easy just to um, to click this. And you can like almost track fronts on it and stuff like that. And you can click it and you can cycle through the day. So you can go along the um, hours just by clicking. And you can see really clearly how the... Um, Clouds being mapped across your um, your task area. What we meant to do at the start of this was turn on the airspace as well. Um, we both forgot. Um, yeah, it's a really good feature actually. Um, you can put the forecast satellite view onto here as well. And again, you can click through the time, and you can um, see exactly where the clouds likely to be or forecast to be, I should say. Um, we've got the surface temperature. I often run this um, against the Met Office model, for example. I um, feel warm at airspace. It's a big plus for Skyset. Yeah, it's really good. Um, really good to see. Um, and I just often to cross check this against some other models um, just to see um, see what's going on. It's pretty pretty uniform in the UK usually, but some countries we've been to, like Hungary or Lithuania, um, the forecast some models are two or three degrees different, which causes a massive difference. So uh, this is really really good to um, just compare those. Um, and again, you can see the dew points if you want to look at those. Um, no dew wind. Onto the wind. So I tend to look straight at the boundary layer wind average. So that's the wind that you're likely to be experiencing when you're flying, when you're going cross country. We've got the waypoints on. Yeah. Um, you can also load up the waypoints someone's just pointed out and we've got we've got those in. Um, so boundary layer wind average is it gives you a very indication of the wind that you're likely to experience when you're flying cross country. And again, you can cycle that for um, the entire time period of the day. Uh, very useful and that tends to give that tends to be what I really look at for um, getting an idea of what the wind is doing on a particular day then there's also the convergence map really quite useful in the UK for seeing sea breezes we'll just zoom out a bit and see if there's anything obvious today doesn't nothing significant but um, quite often on days uh, on light westerlies you'll, you'll see sea breezes along the east coast um, and you're really looking for yellows and reds to, to, to look for anything significant um, on, the, on this convergence map. Going down further, there's then quite a few wave um, parameters. Um, we're not going to talk too much about wave because we don't know enough about it. Definitely, um, you don't know much about that. No. But we've, we've had feedback that a lot of people that, that do use wave, particularly Chris Gill in uh, flying out of Denby in North Wales, um, they really highly rate the, the wave features lots of guys in the Alps and girls sorry. Um, various features down here and experimental stuff that he's adding all the time um, but we're not going to dwell on it because we don't tend to use it too often but they're there and and Scotland good. yeah um, from Hugo uh, Hugo oh hey um, which model does um, SkySet use it gets data from GFS and icon so it has two sources which is um, pretty unique to Soren forecast so yes yeah, quite good wave in Scotland is excellent good feedback Okay, um, just going back up to the top, and I'll put the PFD on, and Finn's going to talk a bit about how we use the point to UT. Mm. I think this is my favourite feature, actually. Um, 
you can um, use the points QT, so you just click it, and you can click um, anywhere on the map. I usually um, tend to click each turn point. Um, I'm going to fly out for the day. So say I was going to Andoversford. Um, I'd just click here, and then I'd run through the day like this and look at a few points, maybe like in the morning, in the middle of the day, and then later on in the day. And you can just um, really easily build up quite a good picture of the day. So you can see here, as we saw on the um, on the cloud forecast, you can see there's a lot more cloud um, expected to be there, and you can see there's a lot more moisture just by looking at this very quickly. Um, you can see very slack winds just above the, um, the thermal layers, and you can just run through the day very, very easily, drying out um, as we go through a little bit of a wind, um, wind change. But we just yeah run through like this, and then we can click. Um, if we come off this very very easily back in points QT, and if we go further south, we can see the air is much drier, um, slightly different wind profile, and you can build a really detailed um, picture of the day up like super fast. It's so easy to use. Um, again, not an expert with stuff like this, but it makes it very easy to um, interpret. I think one of my personal um, favourites on this QT is the the wind gradient on the side. Yeah, it's good. It gives you um, a bit of a clue as to which side of the the cloud um, thermals are likely to be. Um, so yeah, I really like the points QT for all the reasons Finn's mentioned and that um, wind gradient. Um, the other feature that I use, which is a bit more, um, is still a relatively new feature, is the the route forecast. This is more useful, I would say, on bigger tasks. So if you're if you're planning to fly big task on a really good day um, the reason for that we'll just let me just draw one quickly and then we'll talk again um, that might not be possible today the reason why I think it's more useful um, for bigger tasks is because with big tasks you're covering quite a big area and you're going to be at various um, parts of that task at quite significantly different times so the weather conditions could be changing um, across that area quite significantly and that's where this route forecast is quite useful so you can put in your own task, the turn points are in here, so you can be quite precise, you can zoom in and click on the turn point and, and do it accurately. I've just- You've uh, made an impossible task. I've made one a bit quicker. No, oh, it no, it's possible, sorry. So, and then once you've made that task, it gives you various information about that task um, on the top. Personally, I don't tend to use this graph too much, but what I do use is I'll put that, put this, um, these bands up here across the time period that I might be considering for a given day. It, this is a 298 kilometer task. Um, and on the right here, SkySight have got um, a bit of software that basically works out the optimum start time for your given task. Um, so down the right here, it tells me that in a couple class glider, the optimum start time would be 73, uh, would be 11.30 and I should expect to achieve 73 kph. Um, I don't trust this too much, but where I really use this route forecast is for looking at the parameters that um, Finn mentioned earlier in the mid-level and high-level cloud cover and tracking how that moves across the task and how that's going to affect my task. Mm. So it can simulate my start, shows me the position along the task and shows the high cloud cover in relation to that task and where I'm likely to be at that time. And that is my personal um, favorite um, way to use that route forecast feature. The squiggly black line that you can see on the map as well, that is a suggested route by SkySight. So um, they've been working really hard at coding uh, an optimization um, of, your, of your task. So that's what it expects would be the most efficient way to fly that task. I think in the UK, when we fly, we often fly much, much um, smaller tasks than um places like South Africa and Namibia, but um, where they fly along big storms and on big convergence lines, this um, is really, really effective. That's my understanding of it. But in the UK, where the, um, the tasks are quite a lot smaller, the deviations for convergence lines, it needs to be really good to make it worth it because our legs are so short. But where they fly big 1,000 or 1,250K um, triangles with three or 400K legs, stuff like this, it can be a massive, massive advantage. So it's, um, it's pretty cool. It's also quite um, good at avoiding the airspace with that route suggestion. Mm. And that's something that um, SkySight have been working really hard to add in as well. Okay, I think that covers pretty much everything that we look at on SkySight. Um, and I'd say a lot of this stuff you can you can also find in RASP or 
um, top meteo or whatever other soaring forecast you you prefer um, but my I think both of our um, reasons for using sky site is it's ease of use um, and just increased functionality particularly on this route forecasting feature I usually would um, skim over um, probably rasp and top meteo actually on a day but usually do most of my time and um detailed looking in sky site personally so once looked at sky site um you can talk about that yeah so, so um, i'm sure most of you have heard of dave masson and seen his forecast they're just um superb and dave knows a huge amount about weather more than i think i'll ever hope to know um and he spends a lot of time doing forecasts and he does it all for free so um, make sure you say thank you and buy my beer um just quickly on his um his website it's, it's uh saw met i think he's only had it going for about a year so um if any of you haven't seen it um check it out it'll be in the links um we put on after this um but the new site he's basically got an outlook um and then he does an update for the for the next day the night before and if it's a good day usually one in the morning as well if he has time um there's yeah so much detail he puts in and so much time he spends looking at the weather he does um what's really good is he will start suggesting how far you're going to be able to fly on a certain day which is really good because it will be like potential for three to 500k plus for example a few days out or potential 750 day um which probably gets us excited excited and looking at the weather in too much detail a few days out doesn't it but, um but yeah it also gives us quite a bit more confidence on the morning if, yeah if he's still saying it's a 500 day then we're like right okay we're gonna set 500 so um yeah unfortunately this this mainly benefits the south of the uk um so i'm afraid you guys up north you, you'll, you'll need to look elsewhere for for this stuff unless you're planning to fly down south on the big um, days he does he does put it over most of england actually he's, yeah, he's really quite good south. um after sawmet yeah sawmet the next thing um andy roch does um a forecast every morning um well pre um pre coronavirus pre -lock, pre -lock yeah every morning and this is um i usually get we we'll get days forecaster in the evening um and then in the morning like in the week when we're at work um andy roch and the two met office um forecast are the things i uh i look at every morning like without fail even if it's raining even if i know i can't fly and um andy roch is is really good he just has a basic overview um about the day just a couple of lines um like blue to 12 o'clock cumulus in the afternoon three to five k day for example is something he'd say um he has a column on wind, a column on cloud, a column on thermals. So it'll be cumulus base rising to 5,000 feet in the afternoon. Wind, five knots surface, 10 knots um, flying height. Thermals, three to four knots. Um, temperatures, and then we'll have a cross country start time and finish time. And it's yeah, really quite good. Just um, he knows what he's doing with weather, um, and uh, yeah, it's just super easy to read and interpret, and um, just gives you a basic overview. And he does an outlook for. Um, the next few days as well so he'll be like monday good tuesday good wednesday rain and then thursday potentially very good for example um and it's just that simple and it's um yeah really really quick to look at that's probably the first thing i look at in the morning and then i quite like to use uh sid's weather page as well um and again this isn't a very good example of, of the the quality of his forecast because of course we can't fly um but what he'd usually do is he's got a little map with various parts of England um, and and uh, a brief description of what those areas are likely to be like and I particularly like that feature of, of, of it sort of tells you where not to go um, when you're planning your tasks um, so again I look at SIDS weather as well after that um, we then come on to satellite pictures one of our um, preferred providers is SAT24 um, and we've, we won't dwell on this too much because we're going to come into uh, the observation a, a bit more bit later but after the forecasting we then start to look at the satellite pictures we've also um, in our bookmark folder got various webcams scattered around the country um, so Husbos, Lasham, uh, Cambridge Gliding Club, Yorkshire Gliding Club, uh, Bristol and Gloucestershire Gliding Club, Black Mountains Gliding Club they all have webcams and they're very useful um, and we do look at them uh, when we're planning big flights big ladder flights in the morning to, to check that um, the weather is actually going along with what we're expecting. Um, and at the bottom here, we, uh, we've also got access to METARs or TAFs um, for just observing temperature changes as the day goes on. All right, I'll come back to our presentation. 
I hope it wasn't too laggy. We tested it last night. It was okay. But um, hopefully it was uh, easy enough for everyone watching. So you should now be back onto the uh, PowerPoint. Oh, good. It's working nicely. Cool. Um, so that's that's how we do it. That's how we do our forecasting. Um, after the forecast, we've then we've now got our glider on the grid. We're we're ready to go um, on the big day. Seven fifty, no, five hundred in. Um, this is when we start to look at the observation tools, which uh, you'll talk a bit about. Yeah, um, pretty simple, really. But just a few other things you can use in the morning. Um, first thing using is um, is a sat pixel, as we just saw. Usually sat two four. Um, and I try and make sure it's the last thing I look at before I take off on my phone, before it goes in the side pocket. Um, yeah, just um, maybe on a mega day, it's not so important, but most days we find in the UK, there's some front coming in from some direction um, and a big wadge of cloud. So just tracking how that's moving. And um, the later you can get that info, the better, just to see if it's sped up or slowed down or anything like that. Um, especially important in competitions when you're usually pushing um, start times back and back. Um, and then webcams all around the task. Um, and trying to use them like upwind of the task area. So um, if you're flying north and east from last year, I'm always having a look at the Grandson web webcam before I take off. And if you're flying out to the west, um, the Nymphs Field and Tilegraph webcams, especially useful if there's a like, front coming in from the west, we can have a look at Tilegraph and see see where that is and see what that looks like compared to the satellite picture. Um, yeah, really, really useful because um, like, that's what's actually happening. It's not a forecast real life. So um, yeah, super important. And then again, we can use the um, metas, but I wouldn't say I personally really use them, but there is a lot of information there. Um, and the the observations, so um, on a lot of the Gliding Club websites, they've got temperature um, recordings yeah. and uh, cloud uh, estimation, cloud based and stuff, and that's really useful if we're sitting on the grid waiting for the trigger temperature in the blue. Um, we quite often will look at the Lasham weather, weather page waiting for that temperature to go up, and that gives us an indication of whether it's going along with the forecast. That's what we would have been doing today if we flew yeah. this morning in the blue. Um, and keep checking until you go flying. So that's our section on weather. Um, Post-flight analysis. Uh, why do we do it? Why do we do it, Chris? So we get better, basically. To well, usually to find out what we did wrong. Um, yeah, how we lost uh, 500 points, basically. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, learn from mistakes. Um, learn how to improve. Um, learn our gliders is another thing we use it for. Um, and then what we use it for more so now in the winter is um, you can actually use it to study and learn competition tactics. So Jake, even more than I, has um, looked in quite a lot of detail at someone like Seb Cowers traces and learn learning like how he manages high level competition stuff. So there's loads of information you can gain from from looking at it, and we'll try and um, show you some of that. Yeah, I, I don't think I can emphasize how important it is to do. Um, good post flight analysis. I think it makes a massive, um, has a massive effect on your uh, own personal flying. Um, right, that's good. There's quite a lot of software available, it turns out. Uh, I wasn't aware of, of all no, of these types I. until I researched them. Um, we both use Navita CU, which, is, which you've got to pay for, but we think it's well worth the money. It's a really good bit of kit. Uh, and I've been paying my subscription now since I think 2012 or 2013 when I started competition flying. He does as well. Yeah, still still use it re uh, religiously all, all year round. Um, other options, we've got Task Nav, Soaring Lab, and a couple of these others uh, as well. well. We've got links to them at the end of the presentation, so don't worry too much about noting them down now. And how we do it. So just before we, we demonstrate how we use PFA, um, just going to talk. Just going to mention that it's really important to get as much data as possible. And how do you do that? Uh, you need to fly similar or the same tasks as, as many other people as possible. Um, once you've gone flying and, and you've landed, first thing to do is upload your traces to the ladder uh, and the OLC. Then, uh, or if you're in a competition, submit it to the scorer. And then, from those sources, you can download other people's traces and start to compare that to your own. So nice. we'll have a look at how we do it. Coming back onto screen sharing. Let us know if it's working again. Oh, thanks, Phil. Okay. You should now be able to see see you on our computer. 
Yeah, good. Nice. Um, so this is a flight out of Isidon at Isidon International last year. It's a small racing task, 250k or so. And we've just selected a handful of traces, which we've loaded in already to go. The first thing I do once I've, once I've got a selection of traces like this is I will watch the flight back, but I'll synchronize the start time, uh, synchronize the, the playback on start time. So at the top here, go to animate synchronization. And you can choose how you want to synchronize it. Choose synchronize start time. And that's the first thing I do. I, I then play it back. I'm not going to go through the whole flight here, but to, just to give you an idea of how it works. I'll play the whole flight back like this with synchronized start time. And immediately looking at this, I can see um, any obvious routing decisions that led to the winner doing better than the others. So, so here um, we can see that this glider 6 9 is way out in head, way out ahead. In head. <laughs> way out ahead um, with the red track. We can see if they did anything significantly different on the routing. This flight was a really interesting flight because it um, had quite a lot of routing big routing decisions to make, as you can see. There's a, uh, some big deviations going on. But immediately from going through this, you can you can uh, try and work out what the optimum route was. Once I've played that back and uh, had a look at it on a synchronized start time, I then stop it. And I then synchronize it back on real time. And then I play that back. I usually just skip to, if you play it back from, from uh, the start, usually, it would start from takeoff, um, but I just make sure it starts from the start point. And I'm now looking looking at it in real time. And the reason I do that is basically to try and relive the flight from my perspective. So uh, try and look at this and go, right, where were the other gliders? Where were my competitors um, at that particular time? Did I miss some, someone thermaling off my right wing? 5K? That's the main thing looking at this really, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, try and work out what you missed, um, what went well, and relive the flight from your own perspective. So once I've done that, I'll then start um, looking at the statistics. So by this point, we've got an idea of what the best or winner's route was. So the winner on this day was the this red. This day was shambles. Um, and we've got an idea of whether we've missed anything um, obvious around the task. Now we start to look at the statistics. So up here on the statistics tab, Really important to make sure that the task is incorrectly. Um, and to do that, you'd go to edit and task declaration. All of these tasks are set up properly because we've downloaded them straight from Soaring Spot. And um, if they're on Soaring Spot, they should have the correct task in for a competition. If it's not a competition, you need to make sure the task is incorrectly. You then come onto the task tab up here. Don't forget to click the task tab, whatever you do, because it is pointless looking at it otherwise. It's yeah. really important to remember. Make sure you look at the task. Um, and this is where we start to look at the numbers. So some of the big numbers that you'd start to look at. Um, firstly, this speed indication here, this is a task speed. CU, unfortunately, um, for us Brits who, who use about five different uh, units mm. for, for everything, we like to have our task speed in KPH, um, but at all our other speeds in knots. Unfortunately, CU doesn't show that, but um, what we do is we do a very quick conversion um, to work out, uh, make this a number that we recognize. Um, and immediately, I'd start to look at the speeds, the task speed, and compare it with some of the competitors. So we look at Finn's trace. It's a little bit slower, Sierra Delta, T5, and so on and so on. Um, so we know that 6 9 on the day. Um, we start to look at statistics. The, one of the biggest statistics I look at is average climb rate around the task. Um, the winner of the comp day pretty much always is in the top five percent on average climb rate i would say um i think it's very rare now on a standard day especially yeah it's, like... it's very rare that they the that um if you're not climbing well generally you're not you're not going to do particularly well on a day so you need to be really working on improving your average climb rate around the task so we're going to compare this 2.9 knots to the rest of us so finn was 2.4 sierra delta 2.1 i was 2.5 so on and so on um, so it looks like the day winner actually had the best climb, best average uh, climb rate and the task. A uh, very quick indication of um, why he might have done best on that day. Some of the other statistics that we then look at, um, mean L over D. So this gives a very good indication of how well you are rooting through the sky. It's mainly 
relevant on cumulus days. It's not particularly relevant on blue days unless there's some streeting going on that um, one pilot might be using better than others. Um, so mean L over D, we need to look at this number in conjunction with the average glide speeds. So tend to look at the sinking indicated airspeed of 71 knots. It's quite, quite important to look at the indicated airspeed and sinking, not just um, the total, because it's, it's quite different. Um, so mean L over D, 46 to 1, at about 70 knots for the day winner. Compare that with number five, who did 46 to 1 at 70 knots, very similar. And we'll just compare a bit further down. All quite similar, actually. 44 to 1 at 66 knots. What was I? I'm so 45 to 1 at 68 knots. Um, so that gives you an indication of how well you're routing, looking at those two figures. Um, after mean L over D, I then tend to look at the average glide distance. So that's this number here. And that gives you uh, an idea of how selective you're being, so how many climbs you're taking around the task. Um, and you ideally want this average glide distance to be as high as possible. In the UK, with the sort of convection heights that we usually get, um, in most club class gliders, anything above 10K is quite good. Yeah. Um, mm. With the more advanced gliders, 15K, 20K on a good day in the UK would be would be good. Um, in France, this was a reasonable day, so the numbers are reasonably high. It was very, very high as well, so it's slightly inflated. Yeah, so 21K average glide. So this, an idea of how selective uh, the winner was being, we'll compare that with us. 17.7K, so uh, Finn was taking more thermals, Sierra Delta even smaller and so on and so on. So um, immediately we now know roughly how selective we're being um, and how that compares to the winner. It looks like he was being very selective, very pushy, and you will usually find that that number, average glide distance, um, directly correlates with this number, the average climb um, speed, uh, average climb rate around the task. Um, and again, just gives you an indication of how selective you're being. Next we also look at the deviations so to get an idea of how much you're deviating on the task you can look at the total straight distance done here at the top here so 251.7 kilometers was the distance he glid on that task around a task of 220k um, and again you'd compare that with the others so looking at us we're quite similar a little bit less and so on and so on and that gives you an idea of um whether you're deviating too much compared to the winner it's um important to remember with the lds and the glide distance you need to calibrate it to um your glider as well so if you're flying label against those with 20s you need to be aware that you're going to be gliding at a much lower ld but um the principle is the same yeah good yeah. Um, <laughs> the uh, one of the other big things that we look at here is the thermals um number that you're turning left and number you're turning right this you ideally want to be as uh, neutral as possible. Um, Finn really likes to so turn say, right. Yeah. So if we look at his trace, go on. Yeah, that's he about, that's about average. 12 to the right yeah. and two to the left on that particular I hate day. turning left, I just hate um, it, it's so, unnatural. So um, you ideally want that to be as, as even as possible. And if you find that you've got a bias like Finn, um, I'd probably recommend that you practice turning the way you don't like turning and try and even that out a bit. Um, have I missed anything? I think those are the main things that we look at yeah. on, on this page. You can scroll down and you can look at it by each leg. So if you had a particularly bad leg that screws up these um, numbers up here for you, you can look at all the other legs and see how you're doing compared to other people. So like on a day, for example, where you've had a low point and you've got had a really, really slow leg, um, if you can just quickly skim through and see that on all of the other three or four, four legs um, that you're stats and task speed and stuff like that were the same then you know you're still flying well you just had that low point so there's no no need to change anything drastic but um if they're all lower then obviously there's reasons to be addressed the question um why should left and right turns be equal um i don't think this should be equal necessarily i think you should be able to turn left or right as effectively as each other i have a preference and i prefer turning right like personally but i think well, i like to think um i can thermal as well either side so um i think as long as you're effective in both that's probably about right yeah it's, it's mainly to to minimize your bias so um making sure that whenever you're coming under a cloud you're not just turning right because you like turning right you're considering mm. turning left just as much as you are considering turning right um so 
hopefully you'll be more likely to um, hit the thermal um, more accurately each time if you've got no bias. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, and yeah, John Gatford's made a good point. It's interesting to look at thermal yeah. tries too. Um, and that gives you an idea of how much time you're wasting um, dilly-dallying around and uh, not not climbing properly or climbing well. And have a look at the time, not just the numbers for this one. Um, because uh, it's, I think it's up. It's forty-five seconds, so you can it can be ten seconds or forty-five. So the tries isn't always yeah. as important for just the number. Um, okay, we won't go into any more depth here. One of the other pages that we then look at is the paragraph page, and I really like this page because it gives you an idea of how pushy you're being, how risky you're being, and you can compare that to all your competitors. Um, so looking at the winner on the day he, he was in red, we should look at how low he was getting you can see that he was not the lowest around the task most of his flight was flown above 2500 feet um so yeah it's generally what you find is the the day winners are not getting low not getting stuck and not having to take weak climbs um num uh, the pink glider was getting quite low in a few places and that maybe explains you can see that this very gentle gradient here was them taking a weak climb for a long time to make sure that they didn't um uh, that they didn't land out. So, yeah, a really good indication straight away of how risky you're being compared to your competitors. Um, the only other thing I tend to look at sometimes is the, the 3D view, and I tend to use that if I if there was a particular um, part of the task where there were lots of other gliders around, where maybe I didn't see someone that I perhaps should have done or, or needed to in terms of um, a thermal that I missed because I didn't see a glider turning. That's when I tend to look, tend to use the three D view. Well, so if you've had lots of gliders behind you, perhaps in a cloud street or something, it's very nice to look um, look at it in three D and see exactly where they were, why you couldn't see them, and what they were doing differently. Just give you an idea of what that looks like. Just slow it down a bit. Ben Hughes, sorry Ben about that. Um, so yeah, this is the three D view, and I really really Wallop. like it. Gives you really makes it very <laughs> easy bed. to to um, relive the flight and uh, really see what you were seeing in the cockpit. Okay, we'll come back to our uh, presentation. So we had, um, what additional steps um, do you do when flying from a place you've never flew at, weather or region related? Um, probably the first thing I do is speak to people who've flown there before, because um, places we've flown, again, like Hungary and Lithuania have quite a lot of local effects that you just you can't get from a forecast such as soils or forests or rivers and stuff like that so um, speaking to people who have flown there and seeing how that has like a real life translation is, is pretty important um, and yeah how they how they use forecasts and stuff like that and just get as much information but try and trying to be pretty open-minded as well um, going into a new place and um, yeah just getting as much information as possible from the locals yeah in mm, particular it's the main thing I think um, right on to our next slide so from the data that we've just we've just shown you in CU, um, we are pretty nerdy. So quite often, if we're doing analysis properly, we'll then go and put it in a table like this. And we can instantly, immediately see why a particular pilot is going faster than others. So this is on a, on a different day. This is actually flying in Hungary. Um, we actually happened to win the day on this day. 97 kph was the task speed. And you can look at climb rates were, were the highest amongst this, this small selection that we've got here. Our LODs were pretty high. Yeah, the highest again for that particular day. We'd expect that because we're in the high performance gliders than these other ones. Um, we were cruising generally the fastest, which is again to be expected because we're in the highest performance gliders. Average glide distance gives you an idea of selectivity. Um, we've been reasonably selective. And then a deviations indication here. Question from um, um, far right. From Phil Warner. When we're looking at um, LD and speed on our tasks, so. Um, for the glide angle, we obviously want that to be as high as possible, and we're referencing that against the, um, the speed. So if we're doing five points more than everyone else, but we're flying 20 knots slower, then it's no use to us. But if we, um, LD is the glide speed. So for every foot you go forward, or- Stands for lift over drag. Yeah, lift basically over drag. Basically, it's what it stands for. It's how far you're gliding for each meter of height, effectively. So if your LD is 50, you're going 50 meters forward for every um, meter you go down. But, um, so the, LD and speed are interlinked because um, your it was basically glide performance we're looking at. So 
if your LD is good, but your glide speed is low, it's not so useful. But if your LD is good and your speed is good, then you know you've been gliding really well. And um, the slower you fly, the higher your LD would be. So they're, they're linked together. I hope that sort of answers it. Okay. Um, useful links. So these are all the, the links which we'll put up in the presentation. Um, the Google Drive link I've actually left out of this one, but if you go back to the YouTube channel or the uh, BGA webinars page, just Google BGA webinars, you'll see our first presentation on uh, level up in lockdown. And at the end of that, there's a, a tiny link, tiny dot something, um, and that's a Google Drive link, which from the, which you'll be able to download this PowerPoint if you want to uh, view it later on. Um, and you can get access to all of these links then. Um, future BGA webinars that are coming up. So the next one is Phil Sturley talking about flying in the Andes on the 28th of April. It should be really cool. At 7 p.m. Um, and we are going to be coming back at some point in the future, depending on uh, lockdown. And we're going to be talking a bit about how we use equipment while we're flying. And if you have anything else you want to cover, send us a message. If you've yeah. any good ideas. Slide into the DMs. Or, uh, <laughs> I don't know, start a post on URAS or something. Um, any questions? Here we go. Thank you, Adrian. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks for the feedback. Yeah, thank you. Keep insane. <laughs> Jake, we, uh, so Jake's got um, Flight Simulator X, we, and last week we he that. spent sixty pound on a Boeing. Was it seven three seven three seven? It's a really good add-on if add anyone's on. interested in Flight Simulator X, PMDG seven three seven. It's really realistic. Wind gradient thermal. Ah, oh, okay, yeah, of course we can. We knew someone was going to mention. Yeah, we, we talked about this before. Um, so on the wind gradient, it's probably best I bring up the page again. Actually, bear with me. We're just going to look at SkySight again, and I'll try and explain the um, the w w uh, wind gradient. Um, Very points, many thanks. Points QT. So you should all be able to see our screens. It looks like you can. Um, so on the the wind gradient bit on the right here, what you're looking at is getting an idea of whether wind speed is in, is increasing with height or decreasing with height or staying the same. As a general rule, Thanks, in the UK, you will often see that the wind speed is increasing with height up to cloud base. Um, not necessarily by much, but usually it is. And what that will indicate um, is that the thermal is likely to be on the upwind side of the cloud. If you're lower down, if you're if you're less than half cloud base, you probably want to consider searching on the upwind side of the cloud. Um, I can't really show you why that's the case because I haven't got a whiteboard and that I could show you. And I'm really not very good at drawing on the computer. Um, not. But but just try and sort of get that in your head. If the wind profile is increasing, in the wind gradient is increasing with height, wind speed increasing with height, the thermal is more likely to be shifted onto the upwind side of the cloud. Um, on the counter of that, if the wind profile, if the wind speed is decreasing with height, which we do occasionally get, and the only way you'll know about that uh, before you go flying is by looking at this skew T. If the wind profile is decreasing with height then that indicates that the thermals might be on the downwind side of clouds. Um, there have been days, the competition days that I've flown, where I've looked at this wind gradient in the morning and immediately gone flying, and I'm convinced that I, I, I saw that. I saw that in action. Um, mm. I saw that the, cloud, the climbs were shifted on the downwind side. And I remember one day in particular, um, the juniors 2017, the last competition day, UK juniors, um, I landed and I thought, oh, that you know, relatively easy day. And everyone in the debrief was saying how difficult it was to find the climbs. And this is my theory, is that it was it was from this, this wind gradient thing. Um, so hopefully that explains why I think this wind gradient feature is so important. Um, any other questions? In flight weather tool. Um, I wonder if we're allowed to say this. I always look at SatPic if I'm flying towards bad conditions. Um, yeah. You can upload. Um, SkySight onto your UDI um, and the LX9000 now as well, which is pretty cool. So you're uploading the forecast into there, not not live weather, but is the 
the forecast. So um, you can have all of that data in, which is, is pretty cool. Um, yeah, so you can get quite a lot in the cockpit now. Um, in international comps, you get some weather data from the ground as well um, over the radio. But um, yeah, it's main, main things we use in the air. Phil Warner says, do you guys have a take on what leads to a good streeting day um, other than simply being windy? I think um, no wind shear is very important. So that G, we had a webinar from G um, this week about this, and it was really interesting. I don't think I can explain it anywhere near as well as him. I'm not even going to try. I'm but, not going to try. But basically, to, to get an idea of how good the streeting is going to be, I'd look on SkySight, look on the convergence map. That does show streeting, uh, streeting influences. Um, and the other thing I'd do is look at um, the likes of David Masson's or uh, Andy Rush or um, Sid's weather forecasting, and generally they will indicate how likely it is to be streeting. Um, but I, yeah, I think it's very difficult. I don't have the experience yet to be able to work out. Yeah, I don't it understand it enough detail either. In the street on a particular day. Uh, do you look for ridge or wave days for cross country? Mm. Um, not so much flying from Lasham. Yeah, South Downs. Apart from South Downs, but mm. gen yeah, actually, yeah, that's true. Ridge, ridge we, we certainly do um, try to go to South Downs as and when we can. Um, wave, we just haven't done enough yet. We haven't gone and visited enough other sites yet. And um, Southern England is. Um, it's yeah, all a bit so flat and not so good for wave here. Um, but we are going to. We're going to go to Scotland at some point. We're going to go to Wales at some point um, and to the Alps at some point. So we like ridge and wave. Um, any other questions? A few more typing. Three convection are important, but I can't predict reliably. Yeah, it's, so, it's really difficult. I, yeah, I don't understand anywhere near enough to get a good idea of it. But, um, if you ever work it out, let us know, because I'd like to know. You guys typing? A few more people typing. Yeah. Um, Divide this task by two. Yeah, Alice. Alice uh, we haven't talked too much about task setting or, or um, task planning. Uh, I think that's in, literally an, another entire webinar we could do about that. Yeah. Um, but... Um, what I would encourage you to do if you're a, a, a less experienced cross-country pilot or if you're an instructor at your club who who is potentially more experienced, um, I would try and encourage people at your club of similar experience levels to go and fly similar tasks. So uh, Nymphsfield was really good while I was a member there. They do a pundit task, a sort of mid-range task, and then a beginner's task, and they do that for every weekend, um, and they'll have a particular experienced member rotated in on the actual duty roster to set those tasks and to do all the cross-country briefing and cross-country planning. And I think that was a huge um, addition to, I didn't know that. to 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 push push your flying. So uh, people of similar experiences get to go and fly similar tasks, then they get to do the post-flight analysis on it and, and learn from it. I think that's a really good um, thing. And if your club doesn't do that I, and can do that, I would really suggest you try and uh, try and do that. Thank you, Hugo. Well, um, you have a glider to fly with us if you ever need one in the UK. Adrian, ah, 28 right, 32 left. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's a lot better than me. Nice. Any um, any more questions? Speak now or forever hold your peace. One more. Two more. For the next one, we should run like a gliding news because there's so much going on with all the comps being pushed back. We should have a little update session. I'll try and get that ready for the next one. That'd be quite cool. You're very welcome. Thanks for the feedback. I think we've. Uh... I know it's not as exciting as going gliding, but hopefully it's uh, vaguely useful. Cool. All right. I think we're going to finish up. Thank you.